Hi, Clutter Fairy fans. This is the Clutter Fairy Weekly for September 7th, 2021. I'm your co-host, Ed Gumnick, and I'm speaking with Gail Goddard, certified professional organizer and owner of the Clutter Fairy in Houston, Texas. Hi, everybody. The Clutter Fairy Weekly is a webcast and podcast where we dig deep into the clutter that stands between people and the lives they want to be living. We aim to make sense of where so much stuff comes from in the first place, and we offer strategies to slow down the accumulation, reduce the collection, and comfortably manage the stuff we choose to keep. We rely heavily on the questions and topic suggestions we get from you, our viewers and listeners. If you're joining us in the Zoom meeting for the first time, you can share your comments and questions via the chat, and I'll try to make sure Gail answers them before we move on to another topic. We're streaming the webcast live on Facebook, so you can also share your questions and suggestions there, and I'll relay them to Gail. And during the show every Tuesday, you can talk to us live by calling 669-900-6833, use meeting ID 993-419-863 and password clutter to join the meeting. We are going to start this week, as we usually do, by talking about last week's tittle, which was called Crystal Ball Not Required. <laughs> That's a good one. The assignment <laughs> was to evaluate your present living situation with a view toward how well it will support your future, presumably older self, especially in terms of your independence, safety, security, and comfort. We want to hear from our participants in Zoom and Facebook. Who did the tittle this week and how did it go? Please let us know in the comments. YouTube viewer Denise shared this comment about last week's tittle. I realized my lodger put six boxes of herd thinned papers she used your expression, Gail. Right. Thinning, thinning the herd. Thinning the herd. In the loft for me, for me about two years ago. She has left my house and I am out all alone. I don't feel able to stand on a ladder and lift these boxes down. So Nor now, should you. <laughs> right. So now I am on a hunt for a helpful, fit, and young neighbor to do this for me. After listening to your broadcast, I've put out my intention and I know someone will turn up to help. I love how Denise is tackling this problem here. She's exactly on the right track because one, she recognized the limitations of her physical abilities. And there is a point at which the combination of navigating the ladder and holding on to a heavy box is just an impossible task that is a death wish that you don't need to be having. And so she's recognizing she has limitations there. Um, two, she's taken action to do something about the problem now before things get worse. So she's remembered the boxes are up there and she has set her intention to get some help to get it done. And three, she's willing to ask for help. It'll be one 15 minute project for someone to take these boxes down and then she'll be able to deal with those boxes on her terms on the ground floor where it's safe for her to do so. So good job, Denise. And please come and tell us how it works out. Um, you absolutely have the solution to the problem, which is go find somebody able body who can solve that problem in three minutes or 10 minutes or whatever, and then walk away and leave you with what you need to do in a safe space. Can't wait to hear about it. Well, and if she hasn't found any help yet, she might check um, her church if she goes to church or if there's a, a senior center that might have volunteers available yeah 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 to, to, to assist with that kind of job yeah it has to be somebody it's just somebody it has to have 15 minutes they can come over and be there for 15 minutes and get on a ladder get it down and be done and so um it, it'll be a short it'll be a short volunteer gig you just need somebody able-bodied right <laughs> that's exactly. the drill anya said i constantly think about that and i'm fine where i am now for now and a few years on i'll check for other ideas later but and she said i like the stairs in my apartment because those make me move more mm. i hope i will recover a little from my current condition if this won't happen in a few years i'll think about a different place with my husband well the truth is that my dad who is 84 goes up and down the stairs every day he runs up and down the stairs three times as fast as i do and his doctor has said to him yeah you have better knees than me <laughs> So who's, you know, 20 or 30 years younger than him. Some of us have um, better parts than others. And it's just our, our genetics and our lifestyle. And somehow he's got, still got good working knees. And so good for him. It's not 
a health hazard for him to go up and down the stairs. And so he still has stairs and goes up every day and watches them. And the fact that he's still going up and down them also keeps him able to go up and down them. So your right. point is very well taken. You know, if you can do it and do it safely, then keep doing it to keep the skill set going, right? Like that's any physical therapist will tell you, keep doing what you want to be able to do, right? Right. And so yeah. <laughs> good for you that you have your own sort of in-house uh, training system. And uh, there's just, if there's a point where that isn't good anymore, that isn't safe anymore, then you need to adapt for the change. Lise added, not too bad to age in place, but we'll have issues with garden slash yard. I noticed I am starting having trouble keeping up. The bathrooms and flooring will need to be addressed as well. And that sort of puts me in mind of another facet of this, which is there may be things that even though you are able to do them, you don't want to do them anymore. And you're sort of locked into it by your living situation. If you don't want to keep up with it anymore, you have to be prepared to outsource that job or simplify or, or somehow scale it down, right? Scale like, it. Yeah. And I find that gardening is, it's simultaneously something that people love putting a lot of time in, but that is like having to make cook every day it's something that requires constant maintenance right and for some people that is super thrilling and you create a yard that reflects your interest and your focus and the amount of time that you can spend out there and so in your you know middle ages you build it up to this very large very expansive project that then be 20 years later is too much to manage and there's no shame in that. It's just that, you know, you can do one level of activity at one stage in your life and you can do a different level at a different stage. And so just like people redecorate their houses, they can redecorate their yards. And so you can scale it back to something that's more manageable. Stop planning it the way that you've been planning it. Stop, you know, change the beds, uh, trade things out that are, um, renewing instead of having to be uh, redone every year make those changes as a gardener that you know that will make it easier and faster for you to do or be willing to pony up some money for all that those millions of hours that you spend in the garden it's going to cost you to pay for someone else to do those millions of hours but if you love the look and it's really important for you to keep it then uh, that's a way for you to spend your money so um well, or you can invest some money in uh, adjusting it to require mm -hmm. less maintenance, require less watering, plant ground covers and perennials and things that you aren't going to have to fuss with. Right. In the every, same way. Every single season. Shift to container gardening, shift to, you know, s smaller size. You're not going to have 14 rows of vegetable garden. You're going to have one square. You know, you can scale it back or you can decide that managing that yard is more than you want to think about and you can go buy a townhouse and doesn't have any yard at all i mean there's some point at which you can go okay that was fun i'm done now and yeah. and and change your environment to support your new desire for focus craig said our house needs some serious addressing for the inevitable way too many narrow pathways and things to shimmy around what you can shimmy around when you're able-bodied and young is in no way <laughs> As you cannot continue to manage it in the same way. And so um, digging those out now is super important. If, I mean, in terms of like, if I were to go into any kind of um, house that is uh, really hoarded or super dense, my initial focus is always um, mitigation for safety. Like, and that's the first thing I'm going to do is a focus on pathways. Can people move around in the house? Can they get to the bed, the bathroom, the kitchen safely? Can they get to the exit safely? Can they do it with whatever appliances that they're using to move around? Just making that change from it's hard to get from the chair to the bathroom to it's easier to get to the bathroom means that someone's more likely to move more. They're more likely to make that trip because it's not so it's not so hard. It's not such a struggle to make that choice and go to the bathroom. And so I think it affects people's quality of life if they can move around more easily and uh, just addressing, like, even if I ignore everything else in the room and I just make the pathways wide enough for negotiation 
and for someone for you to go and someone to help you go if they need to is a huge improvement in the quality of life and it's an easy focus like I, I don't see anything else blah 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 I'm just focused on this floor from this room to that room it, it narrows down your focus and it, it makes a big improvement in how you live in your house Susan said I'm okay for now and some future years living in a ground floor condo unit in an independent senior community, having a dog forces me to exercise via walking several times a day. Yes, That's it good. does. Very good. Rain or shine. Let me tell you, getting the dog out for walks on the day Hurricane Ida came through or Tropical <laughs> Depression Ida came through was <laughs> very challenging. Um, but it uh, plus adds to social life, talking to neighbors and especially other dog owners. During 2020, I addressed a different type of clutter, redid my will, power of attorney, living will, et cetera, all those end of life paper items that are very important, mm -hmm. but which we all tend to avoid doing or updating. Amelia said, I live in a tiny house that I do not need to worry about a yard because they're maintained by Gardner. I just do the inside maintenance. Yay. Excellent. Yay, exactly. And uh, my mother lived in a, uh, what in essence was a patio home subdivision that had, um, that was sort of like a senior living area. They were selling mostly to 55 plus people. The houses were slightly smaller. And part of the homeowners association dues was that um, the homeowners association hired a landscaping company that would come through and mow everybody's lawn every week and do all the edging and stuff. And so, no one that lived in the place was mowing their own lawn, which was awesome <laughs> and, and safer that way. And then, you know, if you wanted to get out and garden in your container or whatever, fine, but you weren't spending your energy um, keeping the yard fresh and um, edged and mowed. And so sometimes moving to a, a subdivision that is designed that, that way. It helps take some of the burden off of you. We have more comments on this topic, but we need to move on to the main event. Thank you guys for doing the tittle for and uh, having so much to say about it. We appreciate it. The Tao Te Ching tells us that the journey of a thousand miles begins with a single step. I looked that up a few places to make sure that was the <laughs> actual quote, reliable and original <laughs> source. But negative emotions and attitudes can make it hard to find that first step in our organizing process. Today, we're going to share some simple techniques to short circuit your negative thinking, get unstuck, and start or restart reclaiming your space and your life. It's a common project management problem. Whether we're at the beginning or in the middle or almost done, somewhere in the project we hit a wall and we can't figure out how to move forward. It's not that we're unable to do the project or that we've hit a turning point, but that we've hit a turning point, a pivot point, where we don't have the answer about what to do and progress grinds to a halt. In that moment, it feels like we're failing, that we have no idea what we're doing, that the task is impossible. But that's far from the truth, really. Instead, it's one step, one piece of information, one need for outside help that prevents us from continuing the project. We get focused on what's missing and how we don't have the knowledge or the skill or the product we need, and we throw up our hands, believing we're doomed to fail and unable to move forward. It doesn't feel good to be in that place. It's discouraging and defeating, but it's a mental focus habit we can overcome. I offer this point of view to my clients a lot when we hit barriers to getting something done. I find myself saying this phrase often. Let's solve the problem. If we can't do it this way, what can we do instead? Or I understand the problem and I see that your preferred solution won't work or isn't available or can't be obtained this week. Instead of stopping the progress, how can we solve the problem today? What well, alternative or temporary solution will work for now so we can keep going? It helps them to shift mental gears from their initial negative distress response to something more proactive and solution focused. I made a list of negative reasons you get stuck on an organizing project. These ideas can be applied to any type of project, by the way, but I'm going to share them and then talk about ways to tackle each one in hopes of giving you a next step that will move you towards getting it done. So number one, you're stuck on your project because you're overwhelmed with the workload. We've talked about that a lot here. We hear that. I hear that often at clients' houses. Oh my gosh, I'm so overwhelmed. It's such a big project. 
And this is, can really happen at any time in the project from the very beginning when you're facing getting started to the very end when you've been working on it for a long, long time and you're finding yourself at the end going, oh God, I don't have the strength to push to the end. <clears throat> uh, you know, I'm going to add to that because we were talking with people in the room before the meeting started talking about vacations and how you get derailed getting ready for a vacation and then taking the vacation and then coming back. And so uh, sometimes overwhelm is the result of, you know, you were doing everything right but time, the timing went off. You just got knocked out of your groove. Yeah, you know? out of the routine, out of the repetitive steps that were working. Yeah. Something, you know, knocked you off the tracks for a minute. Yeah. It's happening at a moment when you're looking at the whole picture and you're feeling inadequate to the task. And that can take place anywhere along the pathway of your project at being overwhelmed. Um, another reason that you're stuck on might be stuck on the project is that you're afraid to throw out something important. And it told me something very profound about this many years ago. He said, the less you understand something, the more you believe that it's all very important and the less comfortable you feel filtering it out. Uh, insurance is a good example. We all feel completely overwhelmed by our health insurance or our homeowner's insurance. Insurance in general is like there's a professional out there that deals with insurance and we don't think about it very hard. And so if you don't feel like you are very knowledgeable about it, then it all feels super important. It's insurance is an area that requires some education and some understanding of how it works. And if you don't understand it, then every piece of paper that comes from the insurance company feels like it's super, super important and it needs to be kept. And the truth is you don't have to be an expert in insurance to learn a few things about insurance in order to more comfortably filter the paper. But until you learn those few things, it all feels like a piece of dynamite that's about to go off. Like it all feels super, super valuable, important. And you end up keeping a huge volume of paper that you don't need to keep. This applies it to paper. And my example is about paper, but it can really apply to anything that you have. If I'm trying to, you know, if somebody was trying to filter my bee collection, they would have a hard time because they don't understand what they're looking at. They don't understand all of the types of beads and things that are in there. They wouldn't know which was more important, which was less important, which was more valuable, less valuable. If you don't have the skill set or the knowledge base to evaluate something, then that will shut you down. That will stop you from feeling like it's okay to get rid of anything because it all feels important or you recognize that you just are missing the database in order to filter stuff. You know, another category <clears throat> where our ignorance might create that sense of overwhelm is inherited stuff. You know, you, you've gotten a garage full of tools and you don't even know what half of them are to be what, used for. how you would use them yeah exactly. so you can't you you're you can't you know you're in no position to assess their value or what to do with them and it creates that situation where oh god what do i do now and it, and, it makes it feel so much larger than it actually is you know yeah, maybe yeah, it's yeah. maybe it's three boxes of stuff and since it's all from you know your great unknown it, it's all just, greek right it seems <laughs> impossible yeah. yeah, exactly. And, and that was my next, um, you're stuck on the project because you're struggling to deal with a house full of sentimental clutter. Um, your own level of sentimentality will be an obstacle to getting through things as many of you have discovered. And it's not that being sentimental is bad, but that sentimental, sentimentality has to be filtered somewhat through the practicalities of your living space and its storage capacity and also your ability to pass along such things to whoever you think is going to get it. And so you may be saving things because you feel sentimental about it and your house is not an infinite, infinite container. And so you sort of have to crisscross your sentimentality with the capacity that you have in the house and how much storage space you want to surrender to living space and who is going to end up with the stuff in the end. It makes filtering sentimental color more difficult, but it is still... Uh, something you can get around. Uh, you're also feeling stuck because you don't know what organizing systems to set up. A lot of people 
stop get stuck before they get started because they feel like I don't know how to fix this. I don't know how to make this better. And the, and so they don't get moving at all. And it is a process to learn through some trial and error, through some research, through some suggestions, through an organizer, how to organize any particular little space in your house. But there's always something that you can do and you can always go and research the solutions. And so getting stuck because you don't know what you're going to do about it is a couple of steps down the road and you don't want to get stopped just because you don't know what the ultimate solution is going to be. You don't want to be stopped up front because you don't know what the ultimate solution is going to be. Some people also get stuck because they don't know they're happy to go through and sort stuff and um, come up with things to donate, but then they don't know where to comfortably send their donations. And I, that process of getting the things out the door, there's a physical part of that, which is actually getting it in the car or getting it out to somebody who's going to take it from your house or uh, advertising it on next door and having people come pick it up or shipping things because you're going to ship things off to your family or friends or blah, 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 blah. There's many pieces to figuring out where your donations are going to go. But if you get stuck in that place of, I don't know who to trust. I don't know how to dispose. I don't know what to do about this. Then you're going to effectively stop your process because you're going to create the donations and then not be able to get them to go anywhere. (laughs) <laughs> and you stay in the house and then become a pile of donation clutter instead. <clears throat> so these are all places and reasons that you get stuck. And so let's talk a little bit about how you can get unstuck. It's different by type, actually. So if the workload is overwhelming, if this is the place where you're unstuck, uh, that you're already stuck, then the goal is to parse the job into smaller pieces. And you can do that by... Uh, volume. So if you're working in one room, then uh, you can step down to, I'm only going to work on this one table, or I'm only going to work on this one drawer. If you're decluttering the whole house, obviously you can't work on it all simultaneously. So pick one room or one surface or one drawer. (laughs) You can parse the job down to a smaller piece until you hit a small enough piece that you feel like you can get started. So that's about volume. You can also work in smaller pieces of time if you're overwhelmed. Sometimes the idea, people get shut down by the idea of this volume is so big, it's going to take immense amounts of time to get it done. And then their brain sort of goes, "Uh, uh, uh," like shut down time. So instead of contemplating the all of the time it's going to take to do the whole job, instead contemplate smaller pieces of time that you can really manage. So instead of working for a whole day on the project, commit to a couple of hours or commit to 15 minutes if that's all you can do. You can parse the time that you spend down to a time unit that you're willing to start. And for some people, it's five minutes just to get going. And you may find you do that five minutes and then you're sort of in motion and you're able to add five more or 15 more or two hours more. But you, you know, all roads start with a single step. You have to start with that first five minutes to get yourself going. And so if the time is overwhelming, you parse the time down. Sometimes the workload is overwhelming in terms of here's this big mound and I don't know how to tackle it. I don't know what steps to do first. Or even there's not enough room for me to work is sometimes an issue as well. If those things are happening for you, then you can work on um, subtracting obvious trash or easy donations and ignore everything else. Like lots of people tackle a room, sort it into a bunch of piles and start working on the original, uh, on those sorted piles. But if you don't feel like you have the room or you're not feeling like you can tackle that process mentally, then just go get a trash bag and walk around and pluck out trash, pull out recycling, look for boxes that need to be broken down, just work on subtracting. And sometimes that motion reduces the volume enough that you then feel like you can come back and tackle it as a project. You can get emotion about the rest of it. 
it's all about parsing the workload down in some way so that it's easier for you to process and work on. The action of taking that little pile of things you've picked up to the trash or to the recycling bin or putting it through the shredder gives you a little, you know, a little endorphin hit. Yeah, a little win, right? A little win, a little, mm -hmm. a little success to energize right? you for the next thing. And to feel like you're accomplishing something, right? Which is why we talk about uh, taking pictures of what you've done, taking pictures of the trash bags you threw out or making a list of them so that you don't turn around and look at the rest of the job and go, oh my God, there's so much left. Yeah, yeah, but you just took out the first five trash bags and that's good. So if you're, um, if you're stuck because you're afraid you're gonna throw out something important, then um, you can tackle it in this way. Focus on what you're sure about. So there's lots of mails and paper piles around the house that can be easily sorted through and discarded. Even if you don't know what to do with certain kinds of papers, there's got to be lots of others that you can get rid of. And so you can keep forward motion around paperwork, for instance, by working on the stuff that you do feel comfortable sorting and throwing out because that keeps you in motion. And in the meantime, you can ask for guidance from somebody you trust about the item that you're worried about. So maybe you call the insurance guy and ask them some questions or you call your best friend or you call the accountant or you ask your kid, okay, there's this kind of paper, or you call the organizer, <laughs> there's this kind of paper, what do I do with it? What does it mean? It is an, a process of educating yourself enough to answer your own questions and be able to apply some parameters to the papers that you're looking at. And so you don't have to become the insurance expert or you don't have to become the hospital bill expert you just have to get an idea of what is going to be useful to you later and what is just them giving you some information that they're legally required to do or um, reporting interim reporting to you and so that you can tell what they're doing. Um, I often say to people that they're legally required to tell you this is how they're handling your business for you. And so once you realize what they're doing, then you, you're done. You can let go of the piece of paper it's accomplished what it was sent here to do. That applies to financial paperwork and <clears throat> insurance paperwork. And all, there's all kinds of stuff that that's really true. They're trying to fulfill their legal requirements and tell you what they're doing on your behalf. And once you know it, then you're, then you're done. <laughs> that's the end of this. That's the end of the process for you. There's going to be things that you feel like you don't know enough to throw something out. And it's always going to be asking someone for support is going to be your solution. I need guidance from somebody that knows more about it than I do. You can also go through the process of sorting out all the similar items that you have and then make decisions once you can compare them all together. So sometimes you don't want to throw something out because you feel like that's the only evidence of X, Y, Z. That's the only uh, copy you have of something. That's the only oh, look, here's a copy of my passport. I need to keep that because I don't know where the passport is. Well, once you find the actual passport, then you probably don't need the copy anymore. So there's some sorting that you can do to pull similar items together. And then you can make better decisions about what needs to be kept based on comparing them against each other. Um, I often find that people are uh, pretty proactive about they make copies like then when they go on trips and then they make copies of the front and back of all their credit cards. And then they stash the piece of paper somewhere and we find it later and all the credit cards on the piece of paper are now expired credit cards. So it's one of those pieces of paper that doesn't get circulated and updated regularly. We just make new copies and we don't go back and get rid of old ones. And so if you pull all that stuff together, you can then um, filter them uh, based on comparing them one to the other. If you're stuck processing sentimental clutter, um, one of the things that happens is if you're processing inherited stuff, it is usually very emotional and distressing to do it because it reminds you of somebody, it makes you sad, it makes you uh, tap into your grief. Processing sentimental clutter in really, really small bites helps you not completely drown in your own sorrow give it 10 or 15 minutes and then go do something else. 
you'll, you'll be going through it really slowly in 15 minute increments, but you're still making progress and you're not completely derailing your whole day. Some things are more upsetting than others. So start with whatever's easier just to get going. Um, and as you make some of those choices amongst the things that are less upsetting, like you're sorting things that are from a great grandmother that you never met, or you, you don't have fond memories of, you weren't born when this person lived, whatever. It'll be easier for you to go through that stuff than it will be the stuff that is from your mother, for instance. So practice on the family stuff that isn't as distressing and you'll get used to giving up some of the family stuff. And you can use those skills when you get to the stuff that your mother left, for instance. Ask for help from family and friends about the items that you're worried about. So some people feel in their sentimental focus, they feel an obligation to the family. Like they're the ones that have all the genealogy or they're the ones that feel like they need to make this stuff available to their siblings or their cousins or whatever. And so if you have some things that you're concerned that they might want, then this is the time to start asking those questions, taking a picture, sending a text to someone and saying, do you want to have this? Is this something that you care about? And if you ask a couple of members of the family and no one is a taker, then that gives you a little bit of the relief from your worry about, are you throwing away something that somebody else cares about? It's going to take you some time. But things that are sentimental, inherited stuff is always time consuming to process because of all the ways that you're attached to that item. So it takes a little bit more time to pick apart all the attachments and make sure it's okay that you let something go. Particularly if you're the last one standing with all the sentimental things, being in that position where all the siblings have died, there's no kids they're going to inherit. Sometimes you're the, the last man in the family that has received all of your family stuff. And then you have to be the curator that says, it's time to send these things on to a new family because my family is not going to be able to receive these. We're done here. And so being the last man standing, being that curator, pushing the position of saying, okay, I am now, you know, blessing it and kissing it and washing my hands and sending it to the next family to start their traditions with. And you can do that about furniture and paintings and all kinds of things. Uh, somebody saying we've offered a painting to a neighbor. Exactly. Like there are things that someone else can enjoy and you just have to decide who and where you're going to send them on. It's hard to be the last man standing. <laughs> if you're feeling stuck because you don't know what systems to set up. Um, I always tell people to try eliminating the volume of excess first. Most people start panicking about what the systems are going to be when they haven't even started doing any um, sorting, decluttering work at all. And then they're in their mind, they're trying to find systems for all the volume everywhere in the house. And the truth is half of that stuff is probably going to be gone. And so that changes the system that you pick. It changes the space that you need. It changes the containers that you need. It changes where those containers are gonna sit based on the reduced volume that you're gonna keep. So A, before you start worrying about systems, go through and do the decluttering process and eliminate as the volume of stuff that you don't want. And then you'll be able to make a better choice when it comes time to pick an organizing system. And this is where the suggestion you've given lots of times about use something temporary and free or cheap. So if your issue is, well, I, these are things I'm, I'm, I need to assign a place for mm -hmm. and don't get stuck on what is the place and what does it look like? And what, what is the, what containers is will there be? And... Is it pretty? Yeah. Does it yeah. go with my room instead? Just take, a cardboard box that you have and put the things that are going to need a system in that cardboard box or several, you know, shallow tray that is, these are papers that will need to be filed, but I don't know where, or I don't have the know, filing system yet. Yeah. I don't have the system. Yeah. Don't let that, that be your obstacle. Create, yeah, you know, yeah. just, just take a thing that will contain those, those things you want to corral and get started. Yeah, give him a temporary parking space. Basically, he's defining 
he's describing creating a temporary parking space for them instead of the permanent one. And that will allow you to keep going until you get to, here's all the temporary parking spaces that I have to come up with a better solution for. You will need different systems all over the house and the same solutions won't work for everything. So you're going to want to separate active things from the things that you're just storing. And those are going to end up in different systems instead of a paper system that holds all the paper you're going to want a paper system for um, your active files, the ones you're going in and out of all the time, the things that you're working on, your to-do work versus I'm going to store this bank statement and I'm not going to get into it again until the end of the year for taxes. Those are two different systems, right? So one is storing paper, one is actively using paper, and you don't want the same system for both. So once you get rid of the volume and you have a collection of things to deal with, then you can go, okay, here's my papers to file. And why am I keeping them? Is this an active or a passive active or storage problem? And then two different systems for the two kinds. And you don't want to try to search for solutions to all of the systems at once. Search for one system that's going to solve a few problems at a time. If you focus on what to do with the bathroom products on the sink in the bathroom, then you can solve that one problem. Buy and try a few solutions at a time. There's no need to go to container store and come home with $2,000 worth of containers to fix everything in the house at once. So you can work your way around the house installing solutions slowly over time, just like you decluttered the house. And our last uh, stuck solution, let's cross our fingers. If you don't know what to do with donations, uh, this one hangs people up a lot and I'm always surprised, but if knowing where to give it or take it or have it picked up is a problem for you, then you can start with your friends, ask them who they donate things to and can you do it together? Can you piggyback with their donations? Can you guys uh, pick up hers and yours and y'all can go together to offload it? Is it a project that you can do, an errand that you can run and then go have lunch afterwards or something? Look for friends to share the chore and to share their donation suggestions. Uh, you can also ask your or any church, synagogue, mosque, what programs they run and support. Who are they helping? What Do they have a refugee program? Do they have a um, emergency pantry do they, they there's no telling what kind of programs they've got going and who needs support for them and maybe you can donate things to the programs that uh, are close to home you can ask your accountant <laughs> if you have an accountant you can ask the accountant they see lots of donation places on tax return so i'm sure they can look at the list <laughs> and, and offer you some suggestions if there's any kind of collection that you have that you're trying to donate then seek out groups that focus on that type of collection also and let them guide you or offer you an audience to rehome things. Um, um, in, I'm thinking in particular of there's a quilt guild, there's several quilt guilds in Houston, and that would be the best place to take a whole bunch of things that quilters would use, right? So if you have a quilt room that you're downsizing or um, getting rid of or whatever, then you can dial into a quilt guild and say hey i have this stuff to get rid of who wants it and you have a ready-made audience if you have a star trek um you know collectible set pile sitting around the house then talking to a star trek fan group on facebook or on youtube or somewhere um, that puts your stuff in front of an audience that would be interested in collecting it and so Think of who is also consuming the collection that you have and aim for finding them to make those donations. What I'm advocating for here is just a change in your focus away from the initial panic or distress or the feelings of defeat to a focus of problem solving. Pretend it's not you who's stuck, but your best friend. What would you tell her to do? What advice could you offer that person in an effort to be supportive and helpful? You can solve the problem. You just have to step around the feelings that are stopping your problem-solving brain from kicking in. 
always remember sometimes solving the problem is asking for help from someone else who has skills that you don't have. That is a legitimate solution to a persistent problem. Focus on solution opt-ins and you can get your project rolling again. We have lots and lots of comments. I, I want to share one from Judith. Judith says, I have my own issues with clutter. I also live with a person who exhibits clinical hoarding behaviors. This evening, I'm beginning a monthly support group for family members. Oh, good. My block to getting started again is anger and frustration about the hoarding behavior. I look forward to learning how to get, let go of what I cannot change or control and focus on what I can do for and by myself. Someone that has been diagnosed with hoarding syndrome is really struggling with a mental illness. So it isn't about fixing them. It isn't about the cure. It's more about mitigating behaviors and how can you cooperate? How can you coexist? What they're, what they're willing to do and how can you be present with their and interact with and support their mental illness. And, and take it care is, of yourself. And in take the face care of yourself. That. Exactly. Because it's a struggle and it is a hard thing to do. And um, I'm super excited for you that you're joining a support group because that support group is going to understand exactly what you're going through. And they are going to empathize with how you feel about it. And they're going to have practical support to give you about you can do this you can try that you can do this and, and i'm super glad you're doing that great for you you know on a related note um i got a message a while back and i apologize that i'm late in talking about this but um, mary ann who is a member of our group on meetup started her own group called productivity for challenging chronic Dis disorganization and it's a, she wanted to have a peer-to-peer -peer kind, of, kind of group. And so she has started this, and I'm going to share a link in the show notes, but you can also just search for it, Productivity for Challenging Chronic Disorganization. She's, she's in Vienna, Virginia, but I'm, I'm imagining that her events are probably all online. And mm -hmm. right now what they're doing is... Uh, reading one chapter at a time of, of getting things done by David Allen and talking about it. Ooh. And so it's a peer, you know, sort of peer to peer counseling on organization support. support group. And so I encourage anybody who's interested in that. And particularly if you're interested in um, David Allen and getting things done to check it out, they're, they're already into it, but um, I'm sure that you could jump in midstream and, there will be, they'll talk about more, more books going forward. Abby said, this is on the subject of sentimental stuff. We offered mm -hmm. a painting to a neighbor who loved it. We all loved it, loved it, but no one had space when closing mom's house. We had to do that too. There was artwork that mother had bought for very specific places in her house. Um, there were some tall ceilings. There was a, a skylight. And so there were some very, overhead high walls that she had hung artwork on to make them interesting and then it was work that was too big for my sister or I both and so we ended up taking them back to the gallery where she bought them and asking her to resell them um, sometimes it just doesn't you know it works in the house where it was acquired and it doesn't work in the next place and you have to send it on and let somebody else find a space for it Susan said I ask family first, then charity for things charities won't take, give away locally via free cycle or similar. If all these fail, sadly, it has to be the bin. I have largely given up trying to sell things too time consuming and, give, and gives little return. It is a lot of work. I mean, it, there's a reason why it takes so much to do because there's so much interaction to being a used item seller, basically, for you to be a, your own resale store is a lot of work. And it's worth it for things that have a lot of volume, I mean, a lot of value, but it's a lot of time to spend for something that you're going to sell for $2. So better to aim for some bulk solutions than for you to spend all your time, unless you just find it entertaining to do. Like if it's, you know, reselling is fun for you and it's... Uh, you're, you're having a joy in the process, 
then go for it. But if it's not something you find entertaining, then you don't need to try to do it. Do something else. Um, I find that uh, next door is a great way. Uh, she mentioned free cycle. Um, next door is a great way to do that kind of stuff. They have a free section. You can go and make a listing and say, hey, this is on my front porch. You know, who wants it basically and put a picture up of what it is. Or I also put out a lot of things on um, when junk pickup is coming because most towns allow you to put things out, you know, several days in advance. They try to make it, if you're going to get picked up during that week, then they let you start putting it out the weekend before. And so I will put out a lot of things on junk day and they get plucked. They get urban recycled by people coming by because they know it junk, the junk it, they know it's junk day in they your neighborhood schedule. Yeah. and they come around looking for stuff to pick up. And so I'm happy for them to take it away and do whatever they're going to do with it. If I don't want it and I don't want to put the effort into moving it, if I can just get it to the curb, <laughs> then I'm happy to let somebody else pluck it. And then, you know, I've done that where I put out a whole sidewalk of stuff. And then by the time the junk guys come, there's hardly anything left to take. <laughs> like 90% of it's already gone. It's like, awesome. Somebody else took it. Great. And I'm putting 10% into the dump instead of 100%. And that makes me happy. So um, that's worth some kind of effort just to let people know it's there and it's free. And if you do it around when junk day is, then you're less likely to make your neighbors mad because you've got a bunch of stuff out in front of your house. Yes. <laughs> Okay, there are a couple of comments that are going to be a great segue to the tittle, but first, I want to make a couple of quick announcements. Okay. Um, and they're going to sound fairly familiar to those familiar. who are always with us, but I want to remind those who are with us live, because a lot of people seem to find us live first and then only later discover our YouTube channel. <laughs> so I want to mention that our YouTube channel has more than 170 videos on lots and lots of organizing topics. You can find it by going to cfhou.com slash YouTube. While you're there, subscribe to the channel and click the bell icon next to the subscribe button if you'd like to get notifications when we post new content. Hmm. Um, I also want to mention that we will be back next week, same time, um, noon US Central Time, live in Zoom and streaming on Facebook. When we talk about collections, we usually we're usually referring to the deliberate accumulation of items in a narrow category like shot glasses, postcards, or Beanie Babies. We've talked about those lots of times. But there's also a phenomenon whereby we end up with a collection without even trying, like a cupboard full of coffee mugs, 17 kinds of body wash, or enough <laughs> wrapping paper to last for the next 20 Decembers. Right. And next week, Next week's episode, we're going to unpack the sources of and look for solutions for these unintentional collections. Join us September 14th for Unintentional Collections, the stashes we gather without even trying. Okay, so back to some very relevant comments. Jane said, getting the donations out is currently an issue for me. When the donation centers closed, I fell out of my routine for drop-offs. That's just what we were talking about earlier about, you know, you have a routine, it's working great, and then the universe it gets disrupted. steps in. Um, I imagine a lot of people have had a lot of routines short-circuited in the last year and a half. You're right. So Jane says, this week, my tittle should be dropping off the already decluttered items in boxes and bags. Yes, ma'am. Make it your top of your to-do list to start making deliveries. And if it's, if the, the volume is intimidating, then, um, you know, put it in smaller bags that you can carry, make it a trip every day with a few things, whatever it takes to get it out of the house. And if you tack it on to another trip that you're already making, like I have to go to the grocery store and I'm also going to make one extra drive while I'm out and drop something off you will get back into your routine. You can build a new routine and make it happen. I know you can. Go team, go. And then Linda said, try to turn stumbling blocks into stepping stones. This image often helps me craft a way forward when I'm stuck. 
and it's I think a that's a visual. I also think that's a perfect segue to the tittle. So take right. it away, Gail. All right, because today's weekly tittle title is Break Down a Barrier 2. <laughs> so this week's assignment is a fresh version of one that we gave you back in March to identify, clarify, and break down a barrier to entry in your decluttering or organizing process. So start by choosing a task that you've been meaning or wanting to do, but never seem to be able to start. And going to drop off donations at a back tip in the house is a perfect one. Uh, spend a few moments reflecting on what's getting in your way. What is it about this task or project that prevents you from getting started? Spend five minutes writing or sketching about what obstacle stands in your way. Giving a name to the barrier might be all you need to start breaking it down to get it going on your project or task. Can you identify a first step, however small, that would help you move past this barrier? For example, if there's a piece of information you're missing, could you get it by making a phone call or sending an email? Is there a tool, supply, or raw material that you're missing? Would a quick shopping trip get the project unstuck? Are you waiting for help to move past this particular barrier? Whose help do you need? Start the ball rolling by having a conversation with the person who can help you. And don't forget that person doesn't always have to be the same one. If you have somebody that you tap all the time, that maybe you want to uh, give them a break and go look for some alternatives. Like we all love our favorite cat sitter, but sometimes the cat sitter isn't available and you got to go to the next one. So maybe part of getting past this barrier is expanding your helping pool of people that are available and find the person who is exactly right to help with this project instead of calling your husband again or calling your son and waiting for your son to come over. Uh, sometimes the help that is free or the help that is close by or the help that is um, obligated to help you <laughs> has less enthusiasm about it and less willingness to do it in a timely manner. So if you're sitting around for six months waiting for somebody to come and help you do that one thing, maybe it's time to recognize that th that ship has sailed and you need a helper that can get to it in now instead of later. So give us a, a shout out about how it went. Give us if a you report. Can get going. Yeah. We love to hear those reports. <laughs> Okay, if you're watching this on YouTube, we would love for you to join us live. To get notifications about our upcoming events, we invite you to join the meetup group by visiting cfhou.com slash meetup. You can also follow us on Facebook by going to cfhou.com slash Facebook or subscribe to our mailing list by visiting cfhou.com slash subscribe. We love to hear from you, so please keep your questions, comments, and topic suggestions coming on YouTube, Facebook, or through the contact form on our website, which you can find at clutterfairhouston.com. We are so happy to see you guys today and hope that we've given you some good ideas about getting past your stuck points. We'll uh, look forward to hearing how it went as you do the tittle, and we will see you next week. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.